you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. This is Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. The Chris Voss Show.com. Welcome to the big show, my friends. And now, for you, a man who has no bones about having bones in his body, I'm your host, Chris Voss. Welcome to the show, my friends. How are you? I thought that was an appropriate joke. I don't know. for uh, It's a stupid joke, but it's good. It's funny. It's kind of funny. It's not really funny. Anyway, guys, thanks for tuning in. We certainly appreciate you guys being here. Be sure to refer the show to your friends and neighbors and relatives. Put your arm around them. Grab by the hand. Look deeply in their eyes and say, have you subscribed to the Chris Voss Show? Do you want to be part of something that's much bigger than yourself, that gives you love every day, that's a family and not a cult? We're not a cult people, just to make sure we, we, there are some dues though. No, it's free. The show's free. Just enjoy the show. Share it with your family, friends. Why wouldn't you share something that's free? What is wrong with you people? Anyway, enough shaming. Go to youtube.com for it says Chris Voss. Goodreads.com for it says Chris Voss. See everything we're reading and reviewing over there. Uh, all of our groups on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, the big LinkedIn newsletter, et cetera, et cetera. Today we have an amazing uh, woman on the show. She is a physician who uh, decided to become an author. And now she's a publisher. We're going to talk to her about her whole journey and everything she does and how she helps uh, people publish books on top of what she does already. Uh, so we'll be talking to her. Her latest book came out August 31st, 2022. Beyond the Pillars of Salt, Deborah E. Blaine, or Dr. Deborah E. Blaine is here. I always do that wrong because there's the MD at the end. And you're like, wait, oh, there's supposed to be a doctor. They should just get rid of the MD thing and put doc on the end. That should just be, should be like sir, like a title, like you're knighted or something. What do you think, Deborah? Is that a good idea? I love it. No, it there you go. one's good. There you go. I'll submit that to the queen. Oh, oh, well, that's not going to work out, is it? Anyway, uh, Deborah, Deborah is a physician turned author. After 30 plus years practicing medicine, she found that her spirits were in greater need of healing than her body. Boy, you can say that for some people. I've seen them on Facebook. But how can this happen in her fractured society? Where is it hard to encourage people to open their minds to other points of view? Hammers? No, that's not good. The judge says I can't do that anymore. Her answer is truth in fiction. The hope is that if readers get emotionally involved in her characters, it might make a more lasting impression. And perhaps some will think about the critical issues she raises from the safety of entertainment. The truth hurts. Fiction in, or I'm sorry, the truth hurts. Truth in fiction gently guides. You know, people do learn better from entertainment. We call the show uh, infotainment because uh, we teach people, we educate them, and we make them smile and laugh. Or at least they just go, those are really stupid jokes, Chris. Welcome to the show, Deborah. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks a lot, Chris. <laughs> good, good. I'm on a roll on Friday. I'm hitting all zeros. Uh, so give us your .com so people can find you on the show. <laughs> it's just DebraBlaine.com. I know I'm not being funny when I'm cracking myself up, so that's always a good sign. Uh, so Deborah, and, and does that include also your book publishing site? Let me pull that up. Yeah, here. so there's a separate page for my book publishing called Very Indie Press. You can also get there from veryindiepress.com. And there's also a page for my general coaching practice. Do you, do you, do you realize it sounded like a Very Indie Press? Oh, no, I didn't realize that. I was thinking of like the indie presses and, and, you know, I was so happy to find very indie press, but I think you've just ruined that for me now. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I just do the comedy around here. We just, that's what they, that's what they pay me the $5 for when I show up every day. Uh, so Deborah, um, let's get uh, talking about your first book here. Let's get that teased out so people can check that out. Uh, and actually, um, uh, let, let's, uh, let's, let's wind back a little bit. Cause you have a different journey than most authors. You, you, you did, uh, what? two or three decades being a physician i did and what kind of physician are you, you can't give me one word answers okay so i wasn't good so um i trained in family medicine um but i i became a single parent when my son was two and so i started doing urgent care mm -hmm. and that was back in 1994 i started doing urgent care maybe before that um and it was a whole different thing but it was it was a little less stressful than the emergency room yeah. which now is called the emergency department um, but it was shift work. 
So mm -hmm. I knew exactly when I would be off, you know, how long I needed a babysitter for. I didn't have to leave the house at, you know, five in the morning to round on patients and that sort of thing. So it worked out pretty well. That's pretty cool. I didn't know they started calling it the emergency. What did you say? The emergency department? Emergency department. It's now the ED, yeah. not the ER, but most people oh. don't know what I'm talking about when I say the ED. I have so, ED at the ER. But if you think, if you say that to another doctor, if you say ER, they look at you like, where have you been? <laughs> do they really? Yeah. I mean, I, I always did go in and I'm like, this is much larger than an emergency room. Like, right, this is right. poorly, <laughs> aptly named. But uh, I have seen the, the ER for the ED. I don't know what that means. There's a joke there somewhere. You can figure out the little blue pills. Um, so, uh, and then you would decide one day to become an author. How does it, how does it, how do you make this transition? So I just was getting so um, frustrated and disenchanted with what's happened to medicine. So to be clear, I love medicine. What has happened to medicine, by the way? Well, I'm going to tell you, it's become I mean, the, it's become I'm... the American healthcare industry. Ah, it's become an industry. a profit driven, mm. uh, owned by vulture capitalists, I call it. Mm. And um, it, it sort of peddles human life as a business as if it was selling Apple TVs. Mm. And so we are sort of caught in that framework. Um, it's, it's just been, it's, I'd say over the last six or seven years, it's taken a nosedive. Mm. Um, and so I, the reason I actually wrote the first book, this is my first book, Code Blue. Um, I wrote that because I really wanted people to know what was happening and what, what we were going through. The, the subtitle, The Other End of the Stethoscope was supposed to be the title title, but I was talked out of that. Um, because it, it the position that medicine has put us in is that we don't have time to talk to our patients. Mm -hmm. We don't have the choices to, you know, we can't make the choices we think are appropriate. We have to go with whatever the corporation that owns the practice wants us to do. We can only refer in network now. I mean, it's, it's gotten, it's gotten that bad in many cases. Um, we can't get authorization for certain procedures, for certain mm. medications. Wow. We get evaluated on our productivity, which means how you much- You can't get the stuff you need to do your job. Literally, no, no, our productivity is how much money have we brought in to oh, the healthcare okay. organization. Huh? And, and you know, if you're not doing well, you're not gonna get your bonus, you know? And, and, and the salaries are now sort of, you know, um, regulated based on the fact that, well, you're gonna get a bonus. What is it like commission now? Not quite, um, but but and then on top of that, we invite patients to review us after every visit. So oh, wow. now, if you thought you were a patient, you're not a patient anymore, Chris. I'm sorry. I'm going to break the news to you. You are a consumer of healthcare, and and this is it's really. I mean, it's a serious thing. It's it's you know you're you're seen as a as a patron of an organization that provides revenue. And so when, when you get the, have you ever been to the doctor and you get one of these surveys? I haven't. I try to avoid doctors at every yeah, I do too. turn I can. <laughs> I definitely do too. I've been pretty but, lucky in my life. So, um, but when you go to a doctor, most of, you know, for, especially for these big name healthcare um, centers, you, um, you'll get a, you'll get a review, a survey at the end and they'll ask you a whole bunch of questions. But what's really interesting is they're not really interested in whether, what the outcome of your visit was like, are you better? That's not one of the questions. Oh, really? Like, can we help you? They want to know if the, you know, if the staff was friendly and they want to know if you felt happy with your result. And, and what they really want to know is how likely are you to visit that same healthcare institution the next time you get sick? They don't oh, tell wow. you that, but that's really what they're looking for. That's crazy. You know, I, we see this a lot in, in, um, uh, in different things. Um, but uh, uh, there's there's a, you know, I get that from GoDaddy or I get that from just about anybody. I exactly. do customer service and they send you a thing and they're kind of designed to get the answers they're looking for, not the answers you want to give. Like, I'd be like, yeah, I want to tell you about the bad service I got. And there's like no things for that. There's like no boxes. It's all just like one to ten. Tell us where you're at. And, and then half the time you're like, you know, I'm pretty sure that if I complain about the company you're going to fire that person because that the, the person, the wording is like, did Joe give you a, you know, right. Right. You? It's all about Joe. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about Joe. And you're like, ah, oh, man, I want to complain about the company because the company's bad. Joe's just some poor guy, schmo, you know, doing the thing. Right. Anyway. So you uh, start your first book and write well, that out. So what I did was I started writing these little 
encounters in the book, little patient encounters. You know, every single encounter in the book is based on a real interaction. Mm. And um, but of course, the names are changed and subtle changes are made so that you could possibly recognize the person, the actual mm -hmm. person. Um, but it was everything was, you know, it was just aimed at demonstrating one more problem that we have. Um, and 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 I wanted to I, I just wanted to put that out there. But I realized I couldn't write. I didn't want to write that as a as a, a nonfiction book. I didn't because, you know, I didn't want to get fired. <laughs> I didn't want to get sued. Yeah. You know, so like if I start complaining about the healthcare institution and they figure out that's where I work, you know, I'm in big trouble. So uh -huh. I decided I had to make it a fiction. Mm -hmm. So when you write a fiction, you need a hero, you need a villain, you need a plot, you need all kinds of obstacles and challenges. And, you know, so so that became, um, you know, it became a different whole different project. And I actually wrote two books. I worked with a, a fabulous mentor. His name is Rich Kervolin, and he's um, he's retired from um, as faculty at, at USC, I think. And um, we worked together for a while, and he taught me how to feel, how to create suspense, and you know, like the, the different factors that are necessary in putting into a thriller. So I had like these two books. I had the the, the suspense part, which was um, the Russian oligarchs uh, oligarchs um, hack into our electronic medical records, oh, wow. and they steal information, extort millions of dollars from the patients and then murder them. That was my thriller. Um, and then I had all these encounters that were going on. And so then I had, I wove them together so that the doctor that you follow around through the clinic becomes, you know, is, is it becomes a victim of this hacking scheme or becomes part oh. of this entangled in the hacking scheme so that the whole thing became a medical thriller but the the background is all pretty much based on fact there you go what kind of patients are you seeing you're russian oligarchs murdering people what's going on over there at your hospital i'm just kidding. Uh, yeah it's <laughs> funny a couple of people said okay so where did this happen like, where did this happen which one i guess no yeah. i just it, 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 it's a story but it sounds like it could have happened where did it happen i just made it sure. up <laughs> all three books are they dystopian fiction uh or so, this, so the um the second book the third one is the dystopian fiction the second book you know once i was done you know with that book um, I wanted to, I, I loved writing. I realized I really loved writing, so I didn't want to stop. So what was I going to write about? So it was, it was 2000, late 2019, 2020, early 2020. And I looked around and, and it just seemed to me that there was so much um, discord within families and communities and people are getting so angry with each other because they're, they believe one way and the other person believes the other way. And instead of being able to talk it out or agree to disagree, you know, all of a sudden, it, you know, there was so much extremism. And so I wanted to write about that. So that was my second book. I started writing that with, I had three things in mind. I had an opening scene because you need an opening scene that will grab someone. Yeah. Um, I, I knew I wanted to use the devil's breath flower, which is a, um, which is a real thing. Vice called it the wow. scariest drug on the planet. It's, um, it's called the zombie drug. And oh, I wanted to I write think about that's it. that's in Florida because, a lot. Yeah, yeah, but it's actually from South America. Eat that with the bath salts, I think, which is weird because your your title is beyond the pillars of salt. So no, no, no. For that one, it's undue influences. Undue influences. Okay. So what is what are the things that are are influencing our minds? What is manipulating us as a population that's creating this lack of communication? This this um, resistance to listening to each other. And so it was partly for me to just say, well, there must be a reason people are being so unreasonable, <laughs> you know, it was for just There's to a reason they're being unreasonable. Yeah. You know, just um, that's the thing about writing is you create your own world and you create mm -hmm. your own outcome and you can make it, you know, at least make sense to you. Hopefully it makes sense to other people. Um, the opening scene for that book is this kid, Joshua, who, who, uh, walks into his uncle's office in, on 6th Avenue in New York City, and he doesn't remember anything about the last three days. He can barely remember his name, and he's covered in blood. It sounds like when I used to drink. Yeah, and <laughs> in a way, but, he, but his toxicology screen was negative. Oh, so wow. they take him to the hospital. His toxicology screen is negative, and he, it, none of the blood's his. That's and, always a bad sign, my judge tells me. Yeah. So, so that's how that, and, and that's basically, it's a very personal story about a family who are struggling with the realization that 
um, their their minds are being manipulated. Oh. And and there's one person who has some immunity to that for a variety of reasons, who is trying to convince in particular his wife to think about things before she just jumps on a platform. You know, just because you identify as a liberal doesn't mean everything the liberals say is something you should jump on. And the same for the conservatives. I tried very hard not to take sides mm-hmm. on that. So that was that was that book. And then, you know, as I was writing it, I was having a really hard time finishing it. And I, I realized I was not going to be able to solve the world's problems in this one book. Mm-hmm. We had a lot of problems. So um, there's a lot I, of problems in the world. So though. I realized I was going to have to write a sequel and that helped me close up the book. And so the sequel is beyond the pillars of salt, which okay. is kind of the um, one possible progression of where our world could be going. Mm-hmm. If we continue, you know, a world without free and fair elections, um, a world where the planet is is breaking up and reclaiming itself due to climate change and, and just planetary changes and upheavals and and how that's going to where does that leave us in a planet that's becoming mm-hmm. uninhabitable? And, yeah. um, and that's leading into my science fiction series, which I just started. There you go. And then after that, it's the planet of the apes, right? Where the apes just take over. Is that could how it be? It could okay. be. Maybe that's another book. I don't know another book but <laughs> uh, lately every now and then when the world's going to hell i had that vision of charlton heston at the on the beach falling to his knees going you mother whatever you know he's got the satchel over there so uh is it the same character uh who's the protagonist running through the whole th- series so in the, the second two books um there are many of the same characters who um and uh, and and the protagonist the protagonists from from undue influences are also protagonists in Pillars of Salt, beyond the Pillars of Salt. And what I realized is, so undue influences, I wrote it in less than a year, and it took my publisher eleven months to get it out. Oh. And it was very frustrating. And when I finished Beyond the Pillars of Salt, I wanted it out faster. And I, you know, I said, well, you know, what can you promise me? And she said, a year. I was like, a year. Wow. What so, are they doing for that year anyway? I'm just curious. I, I don't know. And <laughs> and this was a hybrid publisher. I was paying them. Now, really? I don't want to say anything bad about them because sure. they, they taught me so much and they're good, good people. So I'm not going to, you know, but it, it was just, you know, that was their timeline. So I said, you know what, maybe I need to do something different. And um, yeah. so we have this, uh, one of the closed Facebook groups is Women Physician Writers. Oh, and so there's a lot of you. There are a bunch of us. Wow. And, What's um, going on in the doctor's office? You guys just got plenty of time to do other stuff. No, you know what it is? It's just we, we need to be people. We need to, you know, be yeah. able to have some other passion besides the, the gruel that we go through every day. I so, prefer doctors that are people. Because yeah. the machine ones, they, they, they're not good with the knives. Well, you want to be able to relate to your patients. You want to, ha- you know, have experienced things and understand when somebody has a disappointment or, you know, I mean, we're human beings too. And mm. we want to, you know, have some time for that. My so doctor just anyway- runs in the room and throws penicillin at me and runs out again. Yeah, we try not to do that now because there's yeah. a lot of resistance to antibiotics. And um, they, they ask us to be antibiotic stewards, but then our patients get really ticked off and then they write bad reviews for us. Uh, so I almost <laughs> so got killed by one. Yeah. But well, um, anyway, so she gave me a lot of advice. She publishes all her books herself. She used to use a publisher and, and now she doesn't. And she um, she gave me the heads up about a program I could use to format. And she kind of just gave me a few, you know, um, a few tips and. I figured out the rest, you know, just sort of trial and error. I figured out where I needed to open accounts so that uh, the royalties go right into my account. Otherwise, so if you, when you sell a book, if you go through, if it's through a traditional publisher or a hybrid publisher, they use Ingram or Ingram Sparks pretty much Mm -hmm. universally. Mm -hmm. So let's say somebody wants to buy your book on Amazon. So Ingram takes 16 to 20% of your book and sends it to Amazon. Amazon takes 40% of your book off the top always. And then they have to subtract from that the cost of printing the book. And then what's left is the royalty. Now, Ingram, I think, also charges a processing fee, which Amazon does not. So the difference is when I upload my books directly to Amazon, Amazon takes its 40%. Then we Mm -hmm. subtract the cost of printing the book. The rest is mine. Mm -hmm. 
And so it, I don't have the processing fees. I don't have Ingram's little fingers in there. Um, I'm not with a publisher who's going to split the royalties with me. They're all mine, 100%. Yeah. So, and not only that, but I can see, you know, in real time within a day or two, how many sales I've had. Um, on KDP, I can just look at it and see. You know, Barnes and Noble has this, a similar sort of thing. I can see my sales there. Apple has the same kind of thing. Yeah, Apple's um, cool. You know, so it, it just doesn't make sense to me anymore. To um, and and plus, you know, when you when you use a traditional publisher, you lose the rights, as you were just talking about. Hey, you lose you lose the copyright lines rights. It's technically yeah. their text. And then, like, if, I was talking to a friend, and they're like, "Hey, I want to go back and change my, I want to go back and change a couple things." I don't know how much, you know, but it's like, I can't do it. Can't do any of it. I'm like, what if you like, you misspelled some words there, eh? And I can't do it. <laughs> I'm like, well, wow. But, you know, they do a lot of editing. To ask your publisher to fix that. Yeah. If you misspelled it, something. But I think, uh, yeah, there's probably a format for that. But, yeah, if you want to change something, you know, a paragraph or something, it's like you, you're going to have to go through, like, I don't know, the gauntlet of approvals. So you decide to start your own uh, publishing company. And so now you really I, a publishing company. It's more of okay. a, it's, it's an extension of my coaching practice. Okay. So um, I, cause I, I'm not keeping track of people's sales, which is why, you know, publishing companies have to charge fees. I, I don't want anything to do with your sales. I'm not doing bookkeeping, but what I do is I provide them with all the links that they need, all the companies they may want to establish accounts with where to get their ISBN identifiers and their barcodes. Um, you know, I give them options for choosing editors or they can find their own editors. Um, the same thing with the cover designer, put it all together. And then we get back together again and I, I plug it in the program and it formats. And, and then I, you know, we, we go through it and make sure everything looks the way they want. They can choose their font, their trim size. And then I send it to them. They look everything over. If they have anything they want to adjust, we get back together and we fix it. I send them back their files. They upload their own files to the distributors and I have nothing to do with their book anymore. So I don't have to charge them extra. I just charge them, you know, for the time I spend coaching them, guiding them. I'm available by email or text or, you know, whatever it is so that they can get their book out there. And then, you know, they've got their book. Yeah. I, keep, I keep their files for about three months. I, I notify them before I'm going to delete them because it does start to take up a lot of room, a lot of memory. And then um, I, I keep the, yeah, I just keep like a copy of the, the formatted portion so that I can make adjustments. So let's say you put up your book on Amazon and you realize, or Apple, and there's a bunch of typos. Okay. If it's a few typos, we can fix it in the program. If it's a lot, some major changes, just, you know, redo it, change it in your Word document. We'll you know, well, I'll re-upload it and reformat it and you can fix it and just upload it. That is awesome. You know, I, I hear a lot of complaints in the green room when we first, you know, start the show and we're, and we're laying out the foundation for the show and what we're going to do and talk about. Um, <clears throat> and we, you know, we have Simon Schuster, Harper Collins, we have great relationships with all the great publishers. They send us other people. So, um, but yeah, you know, I'll hear from authors every now and then that'll be like, oh, man, I didn't even get to pick the cover of my book. I'm like, what? Exactly. I exactly. didn't even get to pick my own title. I'm like, exactly. what? And I'm like, yeah, they do all that for you and you don't have a choice. And I'm like, you know, I if I've got to spend the rest of my life looking at that book cover and that title and, mm -hmm. you know, representing it to the world and being like, yeah, I wrote the book, um, that – that will drive me mad if the cover is crap or if I don't like the cover. Yeah. Like I, that will make me mental. I'll be like, "Here, I'll sign your book, uh, but I'm just gonna black out the cover, <laughs> black out the title." There you go. It's personalized, so it's a collector's item. Um, but yeah, I, I've had authors on there like, "Man, I really, really don't like." I've it. had people say they had to change their chapters or omit a yeah. chapter or write a yeah. new chapter. You know that, which is why I went with the hybrid in the beginning mm -hmm. because I wanted it to be mine. Yeah. Um, and and they were good, you know, um, and I and they split royalties 50 50, but it was still turned out to be, you know, kind of bupkis. And they didn't. So I hired this um, for when I started self-publishing, I hired a my own cover designer. And I, I hired someone who's really well known. He's expensive, but he's awesome. He's just amazing. Um, his name is Joe Montgomery. I'll call him out. Oh. Um, and he's uh, he's on a lot of um, covers for many best selling books. And. 
you know, I tell him this is the genre, this is what the story is about, and he creates. He would give, you know, he gives me like five at a time, or you know, hopefully it's not going to be more than five, but you know, and I can say, okay, I like this one, but I want to change this to this, and I want to put this and this one part. This uh, like like in um, Code Blue, the first ones, this um, this part here was something else that I just didn't like. And we were looking for something and looking for something. And, and then I said, well, what about if you just put like an EKG kind of thing there? And, no. and it worked really well. So the position um, tie in. Yeah. Well, it's about, it's about, you know, it's a, it's a medical thriller. Yeah. So we kind of worked together on it. And like I said, he's not cheap, but um, he's worth every penny. And he's, he's just such a good soul. He's not like he, th there's no arrogance or anything. He's so talented but he's just a real, he's a mensch, you know, mensch. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's just a really good guy. And so I've used him now for three covers. Well, and I'll well, tell you my, my expenses now when I publish a book is, is Joe, my cover designer, um, getting, I, I always use at least two editors because yeah. I don't trust myself. I've been with this document yeah. for all this time. And so, they, you know, they, they have some ideas and then you need a proofreader and, um, but those are my two expenses because I've already bought a bunch of ISBNs. I have mm -hmm. the program. Everything's all set up. And that's kind of it, you know? It's the way to go. I mean, so many people self-publish. I mean, ever since kind of Amazon, I guess, started this back in the day and democratized the ability to self-publish. Because there's a lot of people I talk to, like, I have a book, but I can't get any of these big companies yeah. to take interest in me. And, you know, there's if you understand how they work in their game and, a lot of their big money that they make is from, you know, if a, a president uh, writes a book or, you know, some movie star or some TV person writes, a, you know, Oprah or whatever, um, you know, they're, they're going to make a lot of money off that. And then they give smaller royalties down the line. But the real payoff that sells the most books is, is it's the 80-20 rule, really, when it comes down to 20% makes 80 percent of the money and and so some of that other stuff is filler and they're like ah, you know probably lost leaders and and i guess it's kind of like a studio and movie sometimes <laughs> like disney and movies sometimes some some suck and bomb yeah and you're yeah. like well yeah, who needed that billion dollars anyway really yeah. <laughs> um and then some you know make 10 billion dollars or whatever the hell they make these days and uh so there's that but yeah being able to self-publish publish your own book i mean you know there's so many people that uh, can do it now and get their their thing out there. It's great for your brand building, for speaking, coaching services, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Eyes mind to swap flies, and uh, so <laughs> I got some brochures I use for that. <laughs> people around the house knock it off, and that if I can be, oh, I died by the author. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's one way to go. Uh, so there's all sorts of great stuff. So you do the coaching. You help them write their book. Do you, do you help them? Uh, propagate the idea flush out the the concepts because some people kind of like have an idea for a book but that's about so it. that's like a separate so i do both mm. i'm also a writing coach where i work okay. with people you know who are you know at any stage of writing who just want some advice or i've worked with with some authors who have like have barely have an idea for their book but they know kind of what they want to write about mm -hmm. um so yes i work with writers it's a different package because that's more of an ongoing um an ongoing sessions and uh, I'm less so in my my coaching practice for physicians we pretty much meet every week because it's important to kind of you know keep that momentum going with writers I recommend it for the first month and then like if they want to you know if you haven't done a lot of work on your book there's no point in our meeting that week but um, I try to keep one of the things coaches do is we try to keep people accountable that's why you want a coach right you want somebody who's going to say um, hey you know like I know you were busy this week but this is something you really wanted to do now if it's not what you want to do anymore that's okay but but if you really want to do it, you need to make time for yourself to do it. And, and here are some ways you can do that. So I work with writers as they're writing and I work with writers as they're publishing. And it's kind of a separate, the publishing thing, it's a, it's a one-time upfront fee. And, and then we get the book out. Like if it takes us three sessions or five sessions or, you know, seven texts or emails, that's fine. It's all part of the same thing. And I won't leave them until they're happy with the way their books come, come out and they've got it uploaded and they have no more questions. So, but that's really all I'm doing is just, you know, basically showing them that you get this here, you get this here, you get this here, you have a question about how to fill this out, no problem. And I'm formatting it. Mm. So that's that's one package, and it's it's a it's you know it's confined. You're not going to end up paying and paying and paying. So with the writers, it's going to be up to the writer, you know, as they are developing their story. 
and I love to work with right writers are cool. <laughs> they, yeah. You know, Somewhere. they're just, um, they're just good people. They definitely are. I mean, there are people that are trying to help tell the story and, you know, we learn so much in life, whether it's through novels or other, whatever it is, movies, TV, books, we learn through stories and stories are an important aspect of, of you know, they're basically the, the, uh, the uh, human being manual. Cause I don't really, I didn't get one. Did you? No, uh, no. <laughs> mine, mine got lost in the mail. I didn't get one thing. to help me raise my kid either. I was just, I could, <laughs> yeah. They, they definitely don't give manuals for that. They're just like, have fun with that. Here you go just drops out and there it is and you're away you go uh so um you know one of the things that i found in writing is having an accountability person or group is so important yeah because much. i tried to write a book for what was it 20, 10 13 years and until i sat down and had a group with the accountability and started out with like okay we're gonna write an hour a day everyone's gonna write an hour a day and then we're going to put up on a sheet and say, okay, we did our hour. And then whoever doesn't write that hour after the end of the week gets, I don't know, uh, shamed and thrown into a den of wolves or something. I don't know, something like that, right? Or, or has to buy everyone coffee. I don't know. We, we kind of talked about some punishments, but we never really did them. But having that accountability that people were like, hey, man, did you write your hour today? Did you do your... And it really made all the difference in the world made all the difference in the world and so having a coach like you or an accountability person who you know can you you're you've got to be like hey man i know they're gonna call me uh, so i gotta i gotta do my thing and you know, let's close off everything and sit down and focus on you know typing and getting the spoken word out there and it's 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 a, it's a bit like an elephant writing a book it's i mean you just gotta eat it one bite at a time exactly yeah you got to take it one a, bit at a time. Yeah. It's a couple pages. But being in the habit, too, of writing on a consistent basis and then having somebody going, are you writing? Are you doing that consistently? That's really the key because you just wake up one day and you're like, holy crap, there's a book there. Yeah, I try to um, to make a schedule and I say, you know, I'm going to, given what the rest of my life looks like, I, I want to write 5,000 words a week, say, or mm. 7,500 words a week. That doesn't mean I have to write every day but I have to get to that number by the end of the week. And I try to write in the morning because by the time the afternoon comes around, there's everything has sort of come across my, my plate and I'll, I'll get to the writing. I'll get to the writing and I don't get to the writing. And so it's best for me if I, you know, I get downstairs and I have my breakfast and feed the cat and, you know, and I, like I start writing and then, you know, if I can do that for an hour and a half, two hours every day, then I can bang it out and, and it, it gets written, you know, mm -hmm. and I have an accountability partner also. Oh. And um, that's, I think it's a great thing, you know, and uh, we, we keep each other accountable and there's something really exciting about being able to say, yeah, I accomplished this, this, and this, this week, because I have a tendency, you know, without that, I have a tendency to forget about everything I did do and just focus on what I didn't get to. Mm -hmm. And, and that's not, that that's not productive, you know, and, and she'll remind me, but what you were going to do this, did you? Yes, I did that. Oh, and I did that. And I did that. And, and I was like, yeah, I guess it was a pretty good week. You know, so. it gives you a feeling. I think, it, I think why it really succeeds, it gives you a feeling of being on a team, even though it's yeah. kind of a solo project, it's kind of a team sport. And so having that, you know, you, you get that little raw rum. Hey, you wrote, you wrote for an hour, you wrote 5,000 words, you know, good for you. And you got it. And then if you didn't, you get the whole, uh, Oh, we yeah, we don't do that to each other, but it's, you know, we, we're very encouraging. And, and as a coach, I'm very encouraging, you know, like what got in the way, what can you do? What can you do about that next time? Yeah. You know, and it's, it's not about shaming people as a coach. It's about helping them meet their challenges. You know, uh, I want to be a coach so I can shame people for not writing. Yeah, I'm going to be a shaming you might, coach. You might not have a lot of clients after. All. I don't know. I think I'm, I think, <laughs> I think I'm specifically just going to be a shaming coach. And what just in anything, and it's like whatever you want me to call and beat you over the head with because you didn't do it, that's what I'm gonna do. I probably don't have any clients, huh? There's probably some sadomasochists who will pay for that. I don't know, that's, a whole different, <laughs> that's an OnlyFans channel, probably. Anyway, uh, what else do we need to know about to your coaching and what you do with the uh, indie book publishing? Um, so I when I work with physicians or anybody in basically anybody in the corporate world or, or who's just not feeling satisfied or, you know, we have a tendency to um, identify ourselves by what we do. Mm -hmm. 
And so if what we're doing is not is is not fulfilling us at that particular period of our life, it makes us feel really bad. So doctors in particular, who who are you? I'm a doctor. Okay, but who else are you? <laughs> you know, what what else what else are you? You know, and to start to to look at, and it's not just, you know, strictly for doctors, but to start to if you know, like realize and acknowledge all the other roles in life that we play that are really exciting. And then when that one role, let's say being a physician these days is, is not really meeting our expectations that it had before, but there's so many other things in our life that are working well, it makes it a little easier to reframe that and, and to, you know, to just say, okay, well, this part's not going so well, but I can't wait to get off and, and, you know, and, and cook with my, my son or something like that. Cause we are, we're into whatever it is that you do, it can be a tree hugger or a cat rescuer or, you know, whatever it is, but that you know, it's really important that we have other aspects of our lives that we, you know, express ourselves in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it, it's definitely awesome. And you know what? Being an author is cool. Like, I don't know. I, I think because it's so hard. And people get it, and there's so many people that try, and 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 fail. I mean, I tried for a long time, and and the uh, man, when you become an author, wow, it's like it's like a badge of honor, man. Like people are like you're an author, like you pulled that off. Do you know, it's like, funny wow. it's when I used to when people used to hear I was a doctor, it's like wow, you're a doctor. No, nobody cares about that, but oh, you're an author. <laughs> I go up to be, I go up to doctors at parties and say, "Hey, does this look infected?" Just to piss them off. Um, anyway, that's that's why my, my favorite type of guest. <laughs> yeah, I do that just. Uh, I just about, hey, hey, do you do you uh, uh, what does gang green look like? Uh, <laughs> you know, something like that. No, I don't. So fun is fun. Uh, and uh, you made this your personal mission, which is pretty freaking awesome. Do you help writers? That was the question I had. Do you help writers for? just novels or do you help them like with business books, uh, you know, uh, nonfiction writing? So I can do, you know, a lot of things. One thing I, I'm not really, I find that the program I use is not good at is doing workbooks. If somebody wants to have okay. like spaces for writing out things in the book. But I mean, other than that, you know, um, doing, um, you know, picture books, cookbooks, um, you know, how to books, you know, there's a lot of, of self-help books. Um, and, you know, I'm helping people to organize their thoughts and, and to, you know, put them in an appropriate outline so that they can start writing it. Um, so it's not just fiction. Uh, fiction is my favorite, but, mm. um, but yeah, we can, we can work on, you know, and there's, there's so many times when writing a book makes whatever it is that you're doing seem more credible. You can use that as part of your advertising campaign. So it's there nice to have a book. There you go. When I was living down by the river, I wrote a book on living down by the river and people found I was more credible than anything. <laughs> I can steal uh, Chris Farley SNL jokes. Somebody should do a book in that voice of his oh, down by the river. Yeah. Anyway, well, they so. did a song kind of like that, but did they? <laughs> I don't know. It just sounds like something somebody <laughs> sang sometimes. <laughs> I, sh I should write a success how to book like, how to achieve living down by the river 100 ways to realize the realize the loss of all your dreams but you know what i bet there are survival handbooks out there for living by the river living off the grid you know living without electricity and fishing how do you fish for which fish are good and which fish are bad so i mean there's always so much you can get into you know and and that's the it's the thing that you know we don't always look at we, we tend to sort of see the global picture but when we start to look at the details there's there's a lot that can be written and the same when you're writing a fiction and you start to notice what did the person look like why did they feel this way why are they acting that way what motivates them to me that's like the 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 most fun part is creating the characters and seeing you know what makes them behave the way they do because it gives me insight into just you know human beings in general yeah, there was somebody who sent me a podcast. I was looking over to my left screen to see if I could pull it up really quick. Somebody sent me a podcast that was really obscure in the topic. And I don't even remember what it was, but it was, I wish I could pull it up real quick. And I think it had something to do with physicians and, uh, and stuff. But it's a really obscure podcast where I'm just like, 
how many episodes can you do on that? Like, but you know, there's a flavor for everybody. Like back in the eighties, nineties, yeah. there was a magazine for everybody. Now there's a podcast for everybody and a book for everybody. And, and, uh, you know, we get hundreds of pitches on the show and sometimes I'm just kind of like, well, that's interesting, but yeah, no. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's whatever, but it's a big world. There's lots of people that are interested in lots of stuff, but it's, it's great to tell your story and get your message out. What's the best way people can reach out to you and find out more about your services and how to, uh, engage with you on that, uh, if they need, if they can. So they can, um, they can find me on my website, DebraBlaine.com or VeryIndiePress.com. Um, there are, um, on the coaching pages, there's a place you can book a, a free, like a discovery call. Um, or you can email me. My email is, is there. Um, you can, so DebraBlaineMD at Gmail is an easy one to remember. I think there's a different one on the, the website, but don't worry about that. Um, either one is fine. They both get to my, my inbox. And um, if you want to find out about my books, they're all on my website also. And I just, you know, I'd like to ask if anybody does buy this book and, and likes it, if you don't like it, don't do this. But if you like it, um, when it was transferred from the old, they linked the books, the old code blue to the new code blue, and they lost my my reviews so the first page of reviews oh, wow. came over and all the rest are gone and i'm a little heartbroken over that so um this was amazon so if if you like it if you read it and you like it please write a review on amazon now if you read it and you don't like it please don't write a review just like you know reach out to me i'll see if i can fix it for the next edition <laughs> Uh, yeah don't write bad reviews people that's what we always say we always tell people you know hey, write a five-star review in the podcast do that yeah, um, I mean, you know, don't, because, don't write anything less. <laughs> yeah, I mean, four stars is not, in, you know, when we do these surveys in, in medicine, it's it would be like, you know, only a five gives you points. A four gives you nothing, and anything lower than that is a minus, you know? So it's mm. like, it's not, yeah. I, and I, I won't review someone if I don't like what I, what, you know, the service I received or the product. I just won't review it because I just don't want to do that to anybody. But I try to give positive reviews. Yeah. So go yeah. review the books, people. We really appreciate it. Uh, well, it's been wonderful to have you on the show, Deborah. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. There it's you go. You got a great and, sense of humor. Uh, well, I, that's what they, that's what they, pay me the five dollars for i mentioned earlier uh the uh so uh that they, i get like a some drumsticks with some chicken or something and a free pop <laughs> but then i have to leave because they're like get out of here um so uh, give us your dot coms wherever you want people to find you on the interwebs let's get that plug in so this is the one i just gave deborah blaine.com d-e-b-r-a-b-l-a-i-n-e it's the repetition that sinks in. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm learning <laughs> a lot about marketing. So DebraBlaine.com, D-E-B-R-A-B-L-A-I-N-E.com. There you go. There you go. Uh, and, so and you we, can go to the different pages on the through the menu, and you'll find the very indie press right there. So there you go. Order up her book, folks, wherever fine books are sold. Uh, Beyond the Pillars of Salt is the latest one, August 31st, 2022. Order all three and write some great reviews for them as well. Uh, thanks, for us for tuning in. Go to goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Voss, see everything we're doing and reading them all over there. That's always a fun thing. Uh, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, all those great. Well, I don't know about Twitter. It's, we're on Twitter. Yeah, right? I don't know where that's going. Yeah. It's a. Uh, I'm not worried. I'm not worrying anything about that. This is, I'm just watching a billion dollars, billionaire, billion, billion dollars go up in flames and just watching the plane. Some people got nothing better to do with their money. I wish I had that kind of money. I know, right? On stupid shit. If I had it, I'd share it with you. <laughs> there you go. We could go buy, I don't know, stuff and just burn it down to the ground. But I don't know, maybe that maybe he has uh, maybe he needs the write-offs. <laughs> maybe we go take a trip to the moon, you know. Might as well. Maybe we yeah. should send it. All right, well, thanks for tuning in everyone. Be good to each other. Stay safe, and we'll see you guys next time.